Hi, it's day 21 flower. This is 99 plants and it's episode two and it's called sunlight and spectrum because I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about light and spectrum. So stay tuned. We are going to be checking the property to make sure everything is okay. Then we'll name some plants so we can follow their progress throughout the series. We will check on the bug traps we set up last time because we seem to be under attack from leaf miners. Then we're going to do a light spray for bugs before we check in on the bed. And 99 Plants is a series where we grow cannabis outdoors so you can see how to use the products I sell in my hydro store. But for now, let's start with an introduction. Hi, I'm the Grow Boss, and I have a hydro store where I get to meet lots of growers and listen to their stories, which is exactly how I wrote my books. Because for years now, I've been collecting and writing down all the questions my customers ask. And if at any time during this video, you want to find your closest hydro store or where you can buy my book or any of the other products you see in this video, just click the opportunity button when it pops up. Of course, there will be a lesson weaved into every video. And of course, those lessons are always based on the questions my customers ask. And now that you know that, let's catch you back up on what's already happened before we go on. Hi, this is episode one, day seven of 99 plants. And as you can see, the plants started flowering really quick. Check out those pods. And this is just the end of week one. Of course, we walked the grounds and inspected the plants and we found some problems. Like someone didn't buy enough mesh to cover the entire structure. And we found evidence of leaf miners. So we set some sticky traps. Before we get into it though, let's start this week's lesson, Spectrum and Speculation. And to do that, I thought the best place to start is with one of those things you always hear me say, and it's this. There is a customer in my store that swears by every nutrient, every light, and every product I sell. But there is also a customer that blames every nutrient, every light and every product I sell on the death of their crop and how could it be any other way with an 85% failure rate? In fact, I remember back in 2008 when everybody was blaming the death of their crops from off-gassing from the tents. But it wasn't. It wasn't the tent just like it was never the nutrients, just like it was never the light that killed their shit. And I am 100% sure of that fact because good growers were using them too, and they had zero complaints. Besides, off-gassing could never be the cause once you do the math. In fact, I made an entire video series about venting, and the math doesn't even come close to supporting the off-gassing theory, because a 4-inch vortex fan vents 230 CFM. And a 4x8x7 by by tent is only 224 cubic feet. Which means a little 4-inch vortex fan would empty the entire 4x8 tent in less than a minute. So how could off-gassing possibly be responsible for killing the plants? What is, however, a more simple and therefore a more likely reason is that 85% of growers fail no matter what whether they never finish or they never get the yield they're supposed to from the electricity they're paying for. And this is especially true when it comes to the light, because technically, if you're not venting your house AC, powering the light is the most expensive thing in your garden. After all, in the photosynthesis equation, plants use light for energy to combine CO2 and water to make sugar and oxygen. That's why, on average, you get a half pound dry from a 400 watt light, a pound from a 600, and a pound and a half from a 1000 watt light. But then, 
A 1,000 watt light is three times brighter than a 400 watt light. So you should expect three times the results. And that's just from an HID bulb, some of the oldest and most proven technology in our industry. Which brings us back to the lesson and light spectrum, because that's what LED manufacturers all want you to believe, isn't it? That the spectrum of the light and that duplicating the sun spectrum is the most important thing to flowering. And while, yes, spectrum is important, it's also irrelevant to 99% of the growers worried about it because 85% of you are going to fail anyway. Besides, what does spectrum really matter until you get the weight you're supposed to from the lights? Think about it. There's no way for you to tell what type of light the bud was grown under just by looking at it, right? It's not like you can look at this bud and tell me if it was grown with an LED or a T5 or a CMH or in hydro, or in media, or outdoors, and we both know you've never looked at a sack of weed and said, fuck yeah, that shit was grown under some lights with a spectrum that closely approximates the sun. Yo, double my order. For now though, let's get back to our chores. Of course, chore number one is always an inspection of the property because we need to know about any problems before it eats all the cannabis. We start with the small tent and we're just looking for anything that's changed. It could be something as simple as a new hole that the animals are getting in from. Seriously, everything loves cannabis. And now the big tent. And in here we're looking to make sure everything is okay too. No holes in the tent or loose screws in these wood buckets the Bushmaster built because he was in such a rush and didn't want to wait for the smart pots to arrive. And you can see from the last episode we're still missing the roof windscreen panel and the bottom panel on the big tent. And we already bought the paneling to finish the structure but it didn't arrive in time for the video so the Bushmaster here built up this corner for some extra protection. The wind is really beating on the buds. But I'm sure all that will be done by next time. Right, Bushmaster? And the wind might not seem like a threat or a problem, but just between us, it is. And I'm worried about the buds beating and banging against each other and damaging the final product. And truthfully, I am double worried the final product will have sand and dust in it. So I'm glad the Bushmaster did the minimum amount of work for the maximum results because for sure that helped decrease the wind in here and I'm sure he will install the mesh screen when it arrives because flowering starts real quick outdoors and the buds get real big real quick out here. And I'll tell you why in a minute because the answer is spectrum related and then we'll inspect the plants. Okay, before we get back to the plants, let's talk a little more about spectrum and speculation. And you know how earlier I was telling you how little spectrum mattered, even though so many growers are concerned about it and are so micro-focused on it. And you get even more concerned and micro-focused when I tell you it's worthless to even worry about. And I tell you that for several reasons. But before I tell you what they are and put it all together for you, how about I take a moment and we go over the basics first. Like what spectrum is and why do growers micro focus it on it so hard? Okay, here are the three things you need to know about spectrum. First, spectrum has zero to do with flowering cannabis. It's 100% the light schedule that triggers the chemical reaction that causes flowering. Second, yield is based on light and the plant's ability to absorb it because photosynthesis is the fuel that drives the reaction and this entire process. And finally, third, the whole argument about spectrum is irrelevant unless you are the top 1% of growers. And here's why. See, yield is based on light, not the spectrum. So if you're not getting the yield you're supposed to, the spectrum will never fix that. And that's because spectrum has nothing to do with flowering. 
It's seasonal, yes, and may slightly impact the quality and quantity of the bud, but the truth is, cannabis is deciduous, and its flowering schedule is triggered by the light schedule only. Sure, some plants need fire like pine, and some plants require freezing conditions or drought or seasonal rains, but not cannabis. Only one thing triggers flowering and cannabis, and it's not even the amount of light hours. Technically, it's the amount of dark hours. And now that you know that, maybe the question to ask is this. What's the difference between summer and winter light? And now you're on the right track to understanding just how little spectrum matters to most growers and just how important it is to the good ones. What's actually happening is this. During the summer, the days are longer at about 12 hours, and during winter, they're shorter at about 8 hours. But it's not the amount of hours that determines spectrum. It's actually the arc the sun travels across the sky. And here's what I mean. See, when the sun is low on the horizon, the light has to travel through more atmosphere, and it filters out certain wavelengths, and so we perceive this light as red. And then when the sun is higher in the sky, we perceive it as blue because there's less atmosphere and therefore less atmospheric filtering for it to travel through. That's why the harvest moon always appears so orange and so big because the moon appears so low on the horizon. That's also why summer days are longer because the sun has a higher and therefore longer path to take to cross the sky before it dips below the horizon. And that is the key to understanding spectrum and the actual difference between the blue and red colors. And that's because cannabis is shrouded in mysteries and secrets and the manufacturers seized upon that idea and fed into the mystique of it. And that's why we grow with MH bulbs for veg and we flower with the HPS bulbs now, because supposedly the MH bulbs match the summer blues of a sun high in the sky where the days are longer than the nights, and there are more blue hours than red hours in a day. But in the winter light, where the days are short and the sun low on the horizon, there are more red hours than blue. But again, flowering is not about the spectrum. It's about the hours of darkness and the conversion of the chemical PF into PFR inside the plant with one more little known fact about starlight and wavelengths, but I won't tell you about that until the end of the video. Okay, for now, let's get back to our chores and we'll talk a little more about spectrum and speculation later. And since we're already in inspection mode, now would be a good time to choose and name our target plants so we can really take the time to track and document them. And while we do that, the Bushmaster is going to mix up a batch of nutrients because one plant seems to be drinking a little more water than the rest. So let's start in the small tent and let's track A7. She's now Jennifer. Also, B7's now Cha-Cha because she's got to where it counts. And now in the big tent, we're going to track Azasol Mary because this was the plant we tested Azasol on first. Then after 24 hours, we sprayed everything with a low level light mix, but I'll show you more about that later. This beauty is E3. It's the same strain as Azasol Mary, but because she got topped at just the right time, this one got wide. So even though I'm against giving female plants male names, this baby is now Sir Mix-a-Lot. Because from down here, she's got back. And Sir Mix-a-Lot is also a Kush. And finally, Let's name one of the outside plants, and I like Joan because it's crazy out here under the direct sun with no protection from the wind, and Joan sounds 
like a strong female name. And she's a Kush too. And while I catch up on documenting all this in the 20 week garden tracker, there is one more thing you need to know about flowering before we go on. And it's about the actual metabolic process the plant is going through during her transition. See, flowering is like puberty for plants. And even if you start a female seed, the plant is not going to transition into womanhood until she transitions into flower. That's why you can't ever tell the sex of the plant until you flower them because they don't show their pistols until they go through puberty. And I know some of you think you can sex a plant early because of those two little stigma things that come out of the branch wedge during veg, but no, those are stigmas, not pistols. So what we are really talking about here is puberty for plants and there is one specific chemical mediator that is responsible for triggering the change and it's a hormone called PF that gets converted into PFR. And the funny thing about it is it's photosensitive. That's right. If PFR is exposed to even very low light, it breaks back down into PF and that night is wasted because it takes a certain amount of darkness before the conversion takes place and then the PFR needs to exist for a certain amount of time inside the plant to exert its efforts. And again, if at any time during the night the plant is exposed to light, it all reverts back and that night is completely wasted. And I know I was going to tell you a little secret about starlight and why outdoor plants like ours experience such a quick and explosive transition into flower when compared to indoor plants. And I will tell you all about that later in the video. Okay, for now, let's get back to our chores and we'll talk a little more about spectrum and speculation later. And now that we have named the plants, let's inspect the traps because last week we found some evidence of leaf miners. Check that damage out. No wonder they call them leaf miners. They literally tunnel through the leaf. And since problems only get worse if you ignore them, and since the problems are only going to get worse the deeper into flower we get, we thought the best course of action would be a low level spraying around the base of the plants and in the soil and on her legs. Then we'll continue to watch and monitor before we just react and do something we'd be sorry for later because some things like spraying the buds with bug spray is not something that can be undone. And I would prefer at all costs to avoid having to do it. That however is not me saying that I want to avoid the work, that I am scared to use the product, or that I worry about using it on plants meant for consumption. Because I am going to smoke this bud. But ultimately this is about the plants and not me. And I am also just as aware that there is always a trade-off and in this case I am less inclined to use the bug spray the deeper we get into flower for two reasons. One, I don't want the residue in the bud I'm gonna smoke, obviously. But more important, this stuff only kills the bugs. It doesn't actually remove them from the bud and any savvy buyer that knows what to look for can immediately spot the signs and symptoms of an infestation no matter how good you cure or trim it. Okay, before we get back to the plants, let's talk a little more about spectrum and speculation. So, now that you understand light and spectrum and that the angle of the sun determines both the spectrum and the quantity of it, let's talk about the real difference in seasonal lighting now and what it means to flowering, because it's not as big a deal as everybody makes it out to be, and here's why. If the summer day is 12 hours long, 
and there are two hours of red light in the morning and two hours at night when the sun is low on the horizon, then there must be eight hours of blue light in between. And during winter, when the days are eight hours short and the sun's arc keeps it low on the horizon as it travels across the sky, there are three hours of red light in the morning and three hours in the evening, leaving just two hours of blue light in between. So, the real difference between summer and winter light comes down to the fact that the days are shorter and that there are two extra hours of red and six less of blue during the difference between the seasons. Like, oh my God, right? All that discussion about spectrum and what we are actually talking about is 33% less total light and 50% more red light and a 75% decrease in blues, which in my experience is not nearly enough of a difference to make any significant change to most growers' yields, especially since most of you never even get the yield you're supposed to from the light that you have. Besides, can you tell which one of these buds was grown under an LED or an HID or a T5 or a CMH? Because I can assure you, the shit that T5 Dan grows with his T5 light is killing it. And because the buds never got too hot, they've got that smell you just can't hide. And while all of you have been discussing the difference between 2700 Kelvin and 6000 Kelvin spectrum, the reality is T5 Dan flowers with the same bulbs he veges with. And that's because wavelength doesn't affect quality or yield as much as you think. It does, however, affect transition times because did you notice how fast the outdoor plants transitioned into flower and started producing buds? Did you? And do you remember how I told you earlier about the starlight secret? Well, it turns out that red starlight is not like red winter light. It's actually even lower in the spectrum at 740 nanometers. And it turns out that this particular wavelength accelerates the conversion of PF into PFR, which is the chemical that transitions the plant into flower. And where the transition can take up to two weeks indoors. Out here, it happened in like five days. Like, soon as the Bushmaster took down that string of 60-watt lights, these things literally started flowering the next night. So while there is a difference between red light and blue light, and while red light is super important both to flowering and the transition into flower, let's be clear. This is only relevant to good growers because unless you're already getting what you're supposed to from your light, none of this matters because yield is based on light and quality on grower talent. And that applies to everything in life because using the right equipment is only part of the battle, right? You still have to use the right equipment properly. And until you can do that, and until you can get the weight you're supposed to from the light, it won't matter how much light you have, or what spectrum it is, or if it has UVA, or UVB, or how much heat it produces, or how much money you spent on it. Because until you get the basics right, spectrum is just speculation. Okay, for now, let's get back to our chores, and we'll talk a little more about spectrum and speculation later. Okay, this is the veg room, and it's going to be a long veg, because the plants in our flower garden are only in week three, and flowering outside, while it starts pretty quick, tends to run a little long. So, we have a ways to go. But more importantly, I would like to point out now, that you do not use the same topping and lollipopping strategies when vegging large plants indoors that will be flowered outside. And you can see where we had two lights in veg last time. The same amount of plants requires three lights now.
And where it doesn't matter how long her legs are outdoors, because she's never going to get close enough to the light for it to matter, indoors is an entirely different strategy, because there is usually a height limit. And that's exactly why you try to keep them as short and as squat as possible indoors. It's also why good growers complain about their plants getting too tall for their lights. Because when you do this right, this shit grows like a fucking weed. And while I am going to wait until the next episode, which will be about week five, before I even consider adding a sweetener product like a mag sulfur or a flavorful from Humboldt, for now, we'll just keep adding mass quantities of their PK booster because these girls are big. And big girls with big buds want big quantities of PK booster. And that's why the topic for next time is legs and lollipops. Because big girls grow big flowers. For now though, let's finish up with today's lesson, Spectrum and Speculation. And now that I've said all that, I would like to say this about Ushio bulbs and kind LEDs to the good growers, because as much as this stuff doesn't matter when you're in group 85 because you're still killing your crops, because you're overwatering, overfeeding, and your light's too close, when you're good, when you're in club 15, it does matter, because look at how fast these plants transitioned into flower. And if flower really is only eight weeks long, then cutting the transition time from two weeks to one weeks cuts transition time by 50%, yes, but it also increases the time spent in flower by 15%. And if all the magic happens at the end, and after all that time we spent vegging them, and after all that time we spent flowering them, why would we ever want to rush the ending? And that's why I want to show you a couple of things here that really do matter when you're good. And it's bulbs like Ushio and Kind LEDs, because these things are special if you really want to imitate the sun, because there are no better lights than these lights, and here's why. Remember how I said in winter the days are eight hours long, and that there are six hours of red light and just two hours of blue? Well, that's what Dularks are all about. For instance, this is a 1000 watt Dulark, and just like any 1000 watt bulb, it can be fired in any 1000 watt ballast. But if you look more closely at what's inside of it, you'll notice the Dulark combines a 400 watt metal halide and a 600 watt high pressure sodium bulb all into one 1000 watt bulb which if anything was ever going to mimic the winter sun with six hours of red and two hours of blue, you think it would be a bulb with something pretty close to the same ratio, right? 600 watts red, 400 watts blue. Perfect. The dual arc is just like a winter sun, if you're good. Because when you're good, like Club 15 good, the bulb and the right spectrum make all the difference in the world because in the photosynthesis equation, plants use light for energy to combine water and CO2 into sugar and oxygen. And since you can't add more water, all you're left with is CO2 and the best light possible. And that's also why companies like Kind LED build their lights with pre-programmed schedules designed to mimic the sun, like the kind K5 LED with their super wide fisheye lenses. This thing spreads the light out so fast you can use it in a tent. But the most important thing about kind LEDs is that they have like 14 wavelengths in the thing. And because it's digital and it's programmable, they pre-installed a program designed to mimic the sun early morning reds, afternoon blues, late evening oranges, and where a dual arc can be dimmed, like the kind LED can be dimmed, the bulb is always a 6 to 4 ratio, where something like the kind LED, it's infinite. You can do whatever combinations of blues and reds you want. 
Okay, thanks for watching, and thanks to the Bushmaster for another great episode. I am the Grow Boss, and if you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if you have any questions between now and then, you can always schedule a consult with me by clicking here. Trust me, I know how much you've spent and how much time you have invested in this, and I promise I can fix your garden in about an hour, so call me before you quit.